I would like to welcome you to the first program sponsored by the Committee to Free Soviet Jewry here at UCLA. We have the distinct pleasure of now presenting to you the co-founder and head of the Jewish Defense League, Rabbi Meir Kahani. Thank you. Just two weeks ago in Washington, <clears throat> 1,347 Jews sat down on the streets and went to jail. Now, Washington has seen protests in the past, and there have been many, many Jews that have gone to Washington in the past to protest for a great many things. And what makes this protest different from all other protests? <laughs> the strange thing about this protest was that <clears throat> Jews went to Washington two weeks ago to protest and go to jail for Jews, and the Messiah will yet come. And it's important for each and every one here that was not in Washington and didn't go to jail to understand why, what happened, why this thing happened, and something about the incidents that took place on a day which I believe was one of the great days in the history of Jews of this country. To begin with, the sight of 5,000 Jews sitting down in the streets, stretching from K and 16th Streets down to Lafayette Park in the shadow of Mr. Nixon's home, and singing Am Yisrael Chai, and not moving when ordered to get up, <laughs> and sitting and as each cop came over and touched each young, young Jew and said, you're under arrest. And each Jew got up and again shouted, Am Yisrael Chai, or never again, and walked to the police buses. And as the buses filled up, from inside came the chance of bring more buses in the sight of one particular family a father a mother and four children getting arrested and it's quite true the family that gets busted together stays together <laughs> it was a tremendous sight and I don't know who had greater joy and greater nachas the parents or their children. And I do know one thing, that those children who went to jail with their parents for Soviet Jews will never, never, ever forget that day. That day when their parents stopped just telling them what to do, but did it with them. Those are great moments in any person's life. Now, why did 1,347 young Jews decide to pass up the NBA game of the week and go to Washington to see some other sites, sites not usually seen by most Jewish tourists, the inside of Washington prisons? They sat down on K and 16th Streets two weeks ago because 30 years ago their parents didn't. They were 30 years late, 30 years too late. Nobody in this room was alive in 1939 when a ship sailed out of Hamburg, Germany. The St. Louis. And on it were 930 Jews. They were lucky Jews. 
They were among the last Jews that were, that were ever able to get out of, out of Germany. And they went to the one country in the world which was, which was ready to take them in, and that was Cuba. And when they reached Havana, they learned that their entry visas would not be honored. And the Cuban government told them that they'd have to go back. They'd have to go back home, home to Hitler. And there began a tremendous drama as 930 Jews in a ship 90 miles from Collins Avenue in Miami Beach, where other Jews were having a ball, 930 Jews sat and waited for someone to do something for them. And our Jewish leadership, the leadership of all the organizations, went to Washington, D.C. to speak to Franklin Roosevelt, our president. Franklin Roosevelt, for whom all Jews voted. Every Jew voted for Roosevelt. Every Jew cried for Roosevelt when he died. You can look high and low in, in Israel, you won't find monuments for Franklin Roosevelt. They went to Roosevelt and they said to him, Mr. President, 930 Jews would like to live. And if they're sent back, they're going to die. And, ca and can you allow 930 Jews into this country? And he said, I'd love to, but I can't. There's a quota system. And the German quota is filled. And so they asked him to mortgage the quota to future years. And he said, that would be bending the law. And Frank and Rose would, of course, never bent the law. So he said, no, they'll have to go back. And they did. Frank and Roosevelt sympathized with them, but he said he couldn't do anything, so he went home. When he went home, our Jewish leaders went home. When our Jewish leaders went home, 930 Jews went home. I know rabbis, nice, decent types, who got arrested in Selma, Alabama, when it wasn't a question of gas chambers, when it was a question of civil rights and human dignity. And that was a good thing. I know rabbis who went to jail for civil rights in Selma. I don't know of a single rabbi that went to jail for 930 Jews who were going to be killed. I don't know of a single rabbi who, when Frank and Roosevelt said no, decided that he was not going to accept that no. I don't know of a single rabbi who picked up the telephone and called his colleagues and said, gentlemen, out of the pulpits and on and on to the White House and let's get a thousand rabbis and chain ourselves to the White House gates. Nobody, not one, nobody did anything. And I know what happened four years later when World War II broke out and all of a sudden Jews realized that Adolf Hitler meant exactly what he had said. And that those Jews who in the 1920s and 1930s, those crazy paranoid Jews who used to run around saying, Hitler means it, get out of Europe weren't so paranoid. And all of a sudden we Jews learned in 1943 about Auschwitz. And we knew there was an Auschwitz. We knew that there was a, a place on this earth where every day, not every week, not every month, every day 12,000 Jews died. Every day 12,000 Jews were gassed in Auschwitz. Efficiency, and Auschwitz was, was excellent, remarkable. The Germans don't just do things, they do things well. 12,000 Jews every day were brought in by the cattle cars 
and 12,000 other Jews left Auschwitz the easy way. We Jews knew about Auschwitz. Let no Jewish leader say that he didn't know about Auschwitz. There are only two types of people on this earth who claim that they didn't know about Auschwitz at that time. The Germans there and Jewish leaders here. And they're both liars. We knew about Auschwitz. We knew about it from people that had been there and had escaped. We knew about it from men like Rabbi Michael Dov Weismandel, who wrote letters to Geneva, who wrote letters to Jews in Eretz Yisrael, who wrote letters to London, and who gave them a simple concept of how to stop this. He said, bomb the rail lines, bomb the rail lines leading to Auschwitz, bomb the death camp area, and you'll save a million Jews. And Jewish leaders went to Franklin Roosevelt and said, Mr. President, we'd like you to save a million Jews. And Franklin Roosevelt, who always liked to think in terms of Jews, said, fine, how do we do it? And they said, Mr. President, bomb the rail lines. And Franklin Roosevelt, whose planes during World War II used to roam this globe, bombing everything that moved, said, we can't do it for technical reasons. That was the reason that he gave, technical reasons. When a president tells you that he can't do it, what do you do? You go home. After all, a president wouldn't lie, not to Jews who voted for him. So the president went home, and the Jewish leaders went home. And two and a half million Jews died in, in Auschwitz. Now, I know leaders of the American Jewish Congress who went to Mississippi as freedom riders and who had no qualms about breaking the law in Mississippi and who went to jail proudly. Now, I don't know a single Jewish leader who decided to call 100,000 Jews into the streets of Washington and to sit down on K and 16th streets or on Pennsylvania Avenue Nobody did this. No Jewish leader cared enough to do it. Why? That's the question, why? Is it that Jewish leaders are unfeeling? That's not true. That is not true. Jewish leaders do feel. Then why didn't they do what had to be done? It's because we Jews are a frightened people. We're afraid. We're afraid of something called anti-Semitism. And so when Stephen Wise, the uncrowned Pope of the Jewish people in those days, heard from Franklin Roosevelt the following disastrous words, don't make this a Jewish war because, because you'll create anti-Semitism, that was enough. Create anti-Semitism that is the greatest horror that can possibly face Jews. So when in 1971 you hear Jews say, don't be militant on the Soviet Jewish issue because you'll make things worse for Jews there, don't believe them. Because what they're really saying is, be careful of what you do because otherwise you'll make things worse for us here. That's the hang-up, the fear of what will they say, what will they think, what will the non-Jew think. And the Jew in the Galut, in exile, in his insecurities, and in his hang-ups, and in his complexes, sits daily and worries about what will the non-Jew think. That is the origin of his respectability. Respectability is the last refuge of a fearful person. You want us to go to the White House? You want rabbis to go to the White House and chain themselves to the White House gates for Jews? You want American Jewish Congress and 
ADL leaders and committee leaders and 590 leaders to go down into the streets and get arrested and break the law? That's no way for nice Jewish boys to behave, and they don't do it. Because what will they think? What will they say? It's time for Jews to stop worrying about what will non-Jews think. Because if that paralyzes the Jew into inaction on behalf of his brothers and his sisters, then respectability buries us. And it's time for us to stop worrying about winning the love of the world. We have a terrible need, a neurotic need, to be loved and to have the sympathy of the world. The State of Israel, two years ago, learned an interesting lesson about world sympathy. How one wins it and how one loses it. Two years ago, Israel sent its commandos to violate international law and to go to Beirut airport on a Saturday night to make Havdalah over 13 Arab airplanes. <laughs> and that night, and that night, the state of Israel lost the sympathy of the world. 15 to nothing was the vote in the UN. You don't get better than that. The Pope bemoaned the fate of 13 airplanes. And Israel lost the sympathy of the world that it had gained with such great difficulty one week earlier at Athens airport when a Jew was killed. And so that for all those that have a need to be loved is the formula. That's the formula. If you really want to be loved, here it is. If a Jew is killed, you'll get sympathy. And if two Jews are killed, you'll get more sympathy. And if, please God, you work really hard and you hit the jackpot with six million, then a whole bag of goodies sympathy and plaques and monuments and eulogies and Kaddish and Yorzeit and Yisker and Willie Brandt will go to Warsaw and kneel in front of a monument and cry for you. This is sympathy and this is the price you pay for sympathy. Levi Eshkol the late Prime Minister of Israel put it well when following a second condemnation of Israel by the UN I forget which particular one that, that was he told a press conference gentlemen he said you know had we lost the war had we lost it the eulogies over the Jewish state would have been among the most beautiful of all time Imagine the picture. All over the world, parliaments rising for two minutes of silence. Never two and a half million more Jews gone. And he said, instead, we called a cabinet meeting to discuss the question, shall we live? And after heated debate, we voted yes. So we fought, and we won, and they condemn us for this. We prefer it that way. It's time for Jews to understand something. Before you can win anyone's love, you've got to have their respect. And nobody gives you respect. You win respect, first of all, by having self-respect. And all those Jews who march for every cause in the whole world except the Jewish cause 
and who claim that they respect other peoples and love other peoples are liars because no one can respect anyone else until he first respects himself and no one can love anybody else until he first loves himself and this is something for each and every Jew to learn that it's time to come home. It's time to come back to Jewish roots. It's time to come back to Jewish pride. It's time to understand that for a Jew, Jewish is beautiful. This is the concept. It's time to understand that other causes will find people marching for them. But when it's a Jewish problem, when it's a Jewish crisis, who marches for the Jew? Who fights for the Jew? Who gives a damn for the Jew? Nobody but another Jew. I watched the demonstration in Washington for an oppressed people, the Soviet Jews. And I looked to see who else was there? Who among all the peoples for whom we march and for whom we bleed? Who was there? Nobody was there. Nobody but Jews. And learn a lesson from it. Because if we fail to, we guarantee ourselves a second Auschwitz here. It's time to come home. It's time for a Jew to feel Jewish pride. Not too many years ago, there lived a Jew, Zev Jabotinsky, one of the great Jews of our time or any other time, and one of the tragic heroes. And Jabotinsky went around speaking to Jews of Hadar, Jewish pride. He spoke to the Jews in the Polish shtetl and in the ghettos. And yes, Virginia, we had ghettos too. The real kind. We had ghettos and we had suffering pogroms. And we had young Jews whose backs were bent and whose heads were bowed and who accepted a pogrom as something natural. The sun rises and the sun sets up. A pogrom comes, it goes, and we lick our wounds and we count our dead and we go on. And Jabotinsky spoke to them. Hadar, Ivri Gamba only ben Pride, a Jew even in poverty is the son of a prince. Imevedim helech, no tsarta ben melech. Whether a servant or a serf, you have been created the son of a king. These were the words that he spoke to, to these Jews. And he said to them, Jews, it's not a mitzvah to be beaten. Where does it say in our heritage that you have to be shot at and not shoot back? Where does it say that violence is un-Jewish? Who says that violence is un-Jewish? And who says that a Jew must die like a dog and be beaten? Who says these things? Jewish leaders say these things. Violence is not, violence is not Jewish. Violence is un-Jewish. These are the concepts that you hear from Jewish leaders whose Jewish background and education was arrested somewhere at the age of 13. Instant experts on what is Jewish. They tell us what is Jewish. These people whose concepts stem not from Jewish sources, but from liberal concepts, and that is not always the same thing. Un-Jewish. To turn the other cheek, it's true. That's in the Bible. That's true. You've been reading the wrong Bible. 
A Jewish concept comes from a Jewish source and from nothing else. A Jewish source. And Jewish sources speak quite differently. Our Jewish leaders and our Jews who of course send their children to Hebrew school at Hanukkah time and tell them to emulate those great Jewish heroes, the Maccabim, the Maccabees. The Maccabees. These were good Jews, right? These were, of course, apostles of nonviolence. Masada. We climb Masada and our hearts swell with pride as we consider those Jews who met the Romans there with petitions. And there was once a Jew named Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. That is his title. Moses, our teacher. Our teacher. He teaches us things. What does Moses, our teacher, teach us? What does this Moses, who, is, who was not a member of JDL, but a good Jew, an establishment Jew by this time, what did this Moses teach us? In the Jewish Bible, a story is told of a man named Moses who went out to his people, his people, to Jews, and they beheld a remarkable sight, an Egyptian smiting a Jew. Now Moses ran quickly, not to create a committee to study the root causes of Egyptian anti-Semitism, but Moshe went and he did the following thing, Vayachet HaMitzri. Those are the words of the Bible. And he smote the Egyptian. Some Jews may like this. Some Jews may not like it. It may be an un-Jewish thing to smite an, an Egyptian. Something which has become a part of the Jewish habit over the years. <laughs> but whether we like it or we don't like it, it is a Jewish concept. And those Jews who speak of Jewish concepts must accept those concepts whether they like it or not. And when the Talmud says in Brachot on page 48, Amud Bet, the second side, for those who wish to make sure that I'm not lying, that if one comes to slay you, slay him first, some Jews do get uptight. We never did dream that this is a Jewish concept listening to certain rabbis' sermons. But that's true. That is a Jewish concept. And there is a time for peace and there is a time for war. And that's not from the JDL principles. That's from the Bible. So violence is not a good thing. Indeed, it's a bad thing. And it's always a bad thing. And it's never a good thing. But sometimes it's a necessary thing. And all those Jewish leaders and all those Jewish rabbis and all those young Jews who recognize the right of violence on behalf of freedom in Angola and in Mozambique and Antarctica, all those young Jews who recognize that right and not the right of Jewish violence, and all those young Jews who recognize the right of having a national liberation movement in the third world, but don't recognize that right for Jews, there is something fraudulent about those people. There is a right of violence for Jews when there is no other way. And we Jews have a Jewish national liberation movement too. A legitimate one. And a rightful one. And perhaps far more rightful than others. And it's called Zionism. And no one has to apologize for that liberation movement. And I'm tired of seeing pamphlets and leaflets and articles put out apologizing for our rights to our liberation movement and our own state. Does Pakistan apologize for its state? Or Afghanistan for its state? Or Ghana for its state? No, and they don't have to, and we don't either. 
And if the world likes it, it likes it. And if it doesn't like it, up against the wall, and that's it. It's only the Jew that is asked to make a concession. Make a concession, Mr. Mr. Rogers tells us, and Mr. Nixon tells us. Make a concession. And we Jews have made many, many such things. In 1947, we accepted a partition of our land, Eretz Israel, and we willingly gave up 90% of the historical boundaries of Eretz Israel. And we gave it up willingly for peace and for the right to have a little tiny bit of land for ourselves. And the Arabs said no. And the Arabs gambled on, on war. <laughs> when you gamble, sometimes you win. Sometimes you lose. And they lost. And we made a concession during that war. 6,000 Jews fell unnecessarily in that war. 6,000 Jews died. That was a concession to Mr. Rogers and the Arabs and the Kremlin and everyone else. That was a concession. And in 1956, we again held out our hand in peace. And we said, peace. And the Arabs gambled again on $2 billion worth of Soviet arms. And when you gamble, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. They lost again. And we again made a concession. 600 young Jews died. That was a concession. And we took Sinai as a buffer to make sure that there would never again be 600 Jews dying. And Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Dulles told us, give it back. And Mr. Javits told us, give it back. Don't worry, trust them. There are a lot of Uncle Jakes around. So we gave it back. And they said, don't worry. Now there is a peacekeeping force. It'll keep the peace until 1967. And again, we held out a hand in peace. And this time the Arabs said, no, nope, we're gambling again. And this was the Arab of pre-June 4th, 1967. This was El Fatah of pre-June 4th. In those days, nobody spoke of a democratic and multinational and non-racial Palestine. They learned that l later on when they were beaten. In those days, Fatah was speaking very, very differently of pushing Jews into the sea. And I remember quite, quite well the speech of the head of the PLO from Amman on June 3rd when he said, I don't believe there will be a, a single Jew left alive. And the Jews said, let's have peace. And the Arabs said, no. And they gambled. When you gamble, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and baby, did they lose. <laughs> a concession, 700 Jews died. That was a concession. No more apologies. No more concessions. We're tired of it. We're tired of having to make a concession to live a concession to have a state. And we're tired of having young Jews having as their campus Jewish heroes Fidel and Che and Ho 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 and not understanding and not knowing heroes of the Jewish National Freedom Movement. Men like Dov Gruner. And you go to a young Jew and say, Dov Gruner. What's a Dov Gruner? Chanasenish. What is a Chanasenish? Who ever heard of Chanasenish? Who ever heard of Dov Gruner? And how should they know of it? Where do they hear of, of these people? In their synagogues? In their homes? In their schools? 
Whoever sits down and teaches a young Jew Jewish pride and of a national freedom movement and of people like Gruner and Senesh and others, people who are part of the national liberation movement of Haganav, Irgun, of Lehi, and who fought and died. There were Jews in Eretz Yisrael in the 1940s who fought the colonialist, imperialist British at the time that the Arabs were playing footsie with the Nazis. There were men like Dov Gruner who went to the gallows. Real, live, honest-to-goodness heroes that had they come from Afghanistan or Laos or had they been named the Berrigan brothers would have been real, honest-to-goodness, live Jewish heroes. But nobody knows of these people because all they were doing was fighting for a Jewish national liberation movement. And when the imperialists hang Jews, that's nothing to write home about. How should they know anything else? What is the education of the young Jew in America? We take our young Jews to a Hebrew school at the age of 11. His mother takes him by the hand because his father is too busy working and takes him to a Hebrew school, not God forbid to make him Jewish. Let's not get carried away. But so that in two or three years hence, he will make some caterer rich and happy. <laughs> and this is the goal. This is the goal of Jewish education here. And the young Jew sits for two years awaiting that great moment when his Zaydi and Bubby will be flown in from Brownsville or the Bronx and perhaps he may be fortunate he may be fortunate he may perhaps at one point have his rabbi or his teacher say to him you know Yankala Everyone laughs because everyone knows that there are no more Jewish children named Yankala. You know Gordon or Scott or whatever the, the latest American Jewish name is. You know Gordon, a Jew, a Jew doesn't eat bacon. That says, it says so in the Torah. This is a revelation to little Gordon who, who that, that very morning. <laughs> so uh, little, little children are are really very, very nice. They're nice, they're nice kids. And if the rabbi tells you something, you go home when you're age 10 or 11. And you say to your parents, you know, the rabbi said that we, that we can't eat bacon tomorrow morning. And thus begins the American Jewish way of death. His parents seat little Gordon, and they said to him, Gordon, baby, we're not sending you there for that. And Gordon walks away, and his parents walk away, satisfied that one more obstacle in the raising of little Gordon has been overcome. But of course it hasn't. Little children are no fools. You, you don't fool children. They are bright and perceptive, and little Gordon understands what has been told to him. He understands the dichotomy in the American form of Judaism. He understands the sham and the fraud and the hypocrisy. So he'll play the game for two more years. There's money to be made. But in the end, when it's over, when it's over for little Gordon, when he has finished that huge feast, it's all over. Every little bit of it is over for him. And what does he think back on? From when shall he get Jewish pride from this farce and from this sham? Jewish pride? On the contrary, it's something to run from. It's something to put down. It's something to flee. And he does. But because there's a genetic need, 
apparently, for young Jews to march for a cause. He'll march for a cause. And he'll look for a cause. And if it's not a Jewish cause, he'll look for a non-Jewish cause. Or an anti-Jewish cause. But a cause. And so when I go out to the suburbs and speak to the parents of all the little Gordons who are now big Gordons and who are marching for El Fatah, and they say, Rabbi, what's wrong with our children? What's wrong with our children? That's what's wrong. Right there. Because when Dov Guna fought, and when the Irgun and Lechi fought, do you know what the B'nai B'rith in 590 was saying about them? The same things they say today about other Jewish groups that have buried respectability. They say that's un-Jewish. Fighting, shooting, throwing bombs, that's not the Jewish way. That stains the Jewish moral code of honor. And then they went back to Beverly Hills. If you want a young Jew to have pride, you've got to, you've got to recognize what a young Jew wants. He doesn't want you to give him anything. He's tired of it. He's sick of it. He wants you to ask something of him. He says, ask from me to sacrifice. Ask from me to take part in a cause. I want to get busted finally for Jews. That's what he wants. That's what JDL gives him. That's for sure. And that's why 1,347 young Jews went to jail singing and with pride and with shining eyes because finally somebody said to them, go to jail for Soviet Jews. Go to jail for Jews. Go to jail for Jewish pride. Five nineties of this country don't understand this. They don't understand it. They're not of that mentality. And that's why you don't have Jews. That's why we may not be as big as the American Jewish Congress, but we have youth. We have young people in their thousands. Soviet Jewish question. That is the question of our times. We may not save Soviet Jews, but Soviet Jews are doing a tremendous job of saving American Jews. Because they've given us a cause and they've given us some meaning to be Jewish. And I'm telling you that we don't have time. We don't have time on the Soviet Jewish question. Don't believe that the only problem here is national cultural genocide. That's not true. There is a danger of a physical threat to Soviet Jews. It's something that we overlook. And it's because of, of this that we believe that we have the luxury to perpetrate fiascos like Brussels. Because we believe that we have time. We send 750 Jewish leaders thousands of miles at great public Jewish, Jewish expense to sit for three days and resolve that Soviet Jews shall be free. We don't have time for that nonsense. You don't have to take 750 Jews to Brussels for that. They can sit home and resolve the same thing. There is a physical danger to the Jews of the Soviet Union. It's the kind of a danger that we escaped just barely 18 years ago when in 1953 Joseph Stalin revolutionary hero of the masses, following the doctor's plot, drew up lists of hundreds of thousands of Soviet Jews to be sent to camps in Siberia. And God was good to us. Stalin died. But who is to say that it can't happen again? And indeed, the probabilities of it happening again are very, very great. Consider carefully what the Soviet Union sees and what it hears. When it listens to 30,000 Soviet Jews dancing outside the Moscow synagogue, and it hears them shouting, Long live Israel. 
What does the, what does the Kremlin see and what does it hear? It hears 30,000 Soviet citizens saying, long live that fascist state whose pilots shoot down our pilots because Jewish pilots are much, much better pilots than Russian pilots. And what do the Soviets hear? What does the Soviet colonel in the Ovir office hear when he watches as a young Soviet Jew comes in and says, I want to go to Israel. And he says, why do you want to go to Israel? And he says, because, comrade, I have an uncle in Ramat Gan, and I cannot live unless I see my, my uncle. And this colonel knows that he has 12 uncles in Moscow. And that he can very, very well, well live without seeing this, uh, this other uncle. But that his real reason is to go to Israel and in six months' time be in the in Sahal, Israeli army, and be fighting who? Be fighting him. And the Soviets cannot abide this, and they cannot stand this. And for 18 years, they have been weak. There has been a weak government there. But what will happen tomorrow? And who can say that tomorrow there will not be a stronger government and a stronger Kremlin? And if tomorrow they do take Jews, and they do become physical on Jews, can we stand a second crisis of moral conscience in 30 years? How can any Jew say, I sat twice in 30 years and I was silent? Don't get worried about being militant against the Soviet Union. There are three and a half million Soviet Jews and a large portion of those Jews want to be free. And for 47 years, from 1917 to 1964, we didn't have the decency to hold one single street protest in America. Not one protest in 47 years. And I realize that it takes time for, for Jewish groups to make up their minds. But 47 years is a long time. And it's time to break that silence. Don't get uptight when you read about Soviet diplomats being pushed around. It's not so terrible. Because it's the only way. It's the only way to take the Soviet Jewish question off the back pages and put it on page one where it belongs. And if today there are Soviet Jews getting out at an unprecedented rate, it's not because of petitions. And it's not because of the Brussels conference, but it's because certain Jews decided to take the Soviet Jewish problem and make it the Richard M. Nixon problem. And Richard Nixon doesn't worry about Jewish problems, but boy, he loses sleep over Richard Nixon problems. And this is what happens when Soviet diplomats are harassed. And this is what happens when, as I understand, I read in the Times that uh, Soviet cars were firebombed in Washington. And this is what happens when, I understand, I read in the Times, that Soviet buildings were bombed. This is what happens, it suddenly becomes an international problem between two superpowers, neither of, neither of which wants this. The United States and the USSR are building bridges to east and west. A detente is being built over the cries and over the bodies of Soviet Jewry. And no, one, and no one wants these bridges to fall down. And that's why there are salt talks and space talks and trade talks and cultural talks. What happens when the Bolshoi comes here? Uh, what would have happened had the Bolshoi come here? <laughs> what happens when they come here? Why do the Soviets send the Bolshoi or Moiseyev here? Not because they're interested in your cultural level but because it's a political tool, it's a political weapon, because nobody can walk inside and watch the Bolshoi and walk out feeling quite as badly about Russians as when they walked in. And that's what the Russians want. And that's why there is no Bolshoi coming. And this is why we want to cause tension, to take from the Russians what they want much, much more than they want to keep Jews prisoners. We want to make them pay a price for what they want, and that price is Soviet Jews. And they're beginning to pay a small price. They want to pay a small price. They want to buy us off cheaply, and they won't. 
But bear in mind that only if you cry out and only if you do outrageous actions will that Soviet Jewish question be on page one. And if it's not on page one, it won't be solved. Because nobody solves problems that he doesn't hear about. And nobody heard about the Soviet Jewish question. And now there isn't a farmer in Iowa that doesn't know about it. And I'd like to finish. And I'd like to, f well, I'd like to finish, but <laughs> I'm a rabbi. Rabbis go on and on. Uh, and I will finish. With a word to you that are at this campus and that would like to take part in a liberation struggle for Soviet Jews and in a concept of Jewish pride that says Jews come first for Jews. Not that there's no second or third or fourth, but number one for Jews is Jews. We are setting up chapters here and we'd like you to join. And we'd like you to come up afterwards and to sign up. To have a right on kind of Jewishness on this campus. And I'd like to finish with one little story. We Jews who sing and shout, Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel lives, don't really understand the greatness and the depth of those three words. This story may perhaps let you really know the greatness and the indestructibility of the Jewish people. When the Roman Emperor Titus, this, when the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed the Second Temple and exiled the Jewish people from their homeland, he came back to Rome and he built an arch, which he called the Arch of Titus. And on it, he engraved pictures of the Jews going into exile and vessels from the Holy Temple. And he cried out, Judea capta, Judas captured, Judas scattered. There are no more Jews. And indeed, at that moment, Jews were scattered to the four, to the four winds. And the Roman Empire stretched from the middle of Asia to Brittany. And the years passed. And the centuries passed, and all of a sudden, there was no more Roman Empire. But there were still Jews hanging on by their fingernails. A tenacious people, obstinate. Disgustingly so. And in 1943, there was no more Roman Empire. There was, all that was left was a city called Rome. And in 1943, the streets of Rome echoed to the sounds of marching feet. The British Eighth Army had conquered Rome. And as part of the British Eighth Army, was something known as the Jewish Brigade, made up of Jews from Eretz Israel. The new Jew. That's not true. He wasn't, the, he wasn't the new Jew. That was a resurrection of the old Jew, who for the benefit of Jewish leaders, once upon a time used to fight. Once upon a, a time his name was Joshua. And Gideon and Samson and David and Saul and the Maccabim and all the others. And these old Jews marched under the Arch of Titus, and when they finished marching, they took red paint, and they painted on the base of that monument, of that arch, Am Yisrael Chai. And that's the meaning of JDL, when it looks the world in the eye, and it says, never again. If there are people, thank you, if there are people that have, that have to leave, I would really, really like people to come up here and to sign up. But meanwhile, I'm going to be here for her questions. And you can ask anything you want in whatever way you would like to ask it. Yes, standing up now. Yes.
Right. First of all, let me say this to you. Now those figures that you quote are really in great, great conflict. And of that there's no question. But I can tell you that it's not a question of 180 Jews getting out every single, single week. I can tell you that last year, that last year, you didn't get an average of 180 Jews getting out a week. That's for sure. That's for sure. Not at all. Not, it, it wasn't even close. It wasn't even close. That's not true. It's not true. I was in Israel too, and I've spoken to the people too. It's not so. Within the last three months, more Jews got out of the Soviet Union than all last year. And that is true. Now, I'm not going to say for one minute that that in any way satisfies us. In no way. That's no big deal. It's no big deal if 50 Jews got out daily or 100 Jews got out daily. That's no big deal. It's only if every Jew who wants to leave gets out. That's a big deal. And we in no way are satisfied with what's happening now. And this is why in Washington, every single day, the private homes of Soviet diplomats, we managed to get hold of the residences, the private homes, of the uh, addresses of the private homes of Soviet diplomats in Washington, and we pick at them every day legally at midnight. And this is why we sat down in Washington, even after all this great news was coming out of 100 Jews on Monday and 150 Jews on, on Thursday. We're not satisfied with that. But I will say one thing. This nonsense about Jews getting out because of this party, party Congress is nonsense. Because this exodus, this major kind of exodus, started not in March, not in February, but in January. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it will keep up. I don't know. I don't know how the Soviet mind works. And I'm not interested in how that mind works. I just want Soviet Jews out. There is a trial that's starting today of Soviet Jews. And I don't know what will, what, what will come about from that trial. I only know that because of Jewish voices being raised, whether more militant or less militant, but because finally the silence was, was broken, because of that, Jews have started to get out. And I'm not saying that JDL did it. What I am saying is that JDL and other groups that were not silent have been a gadfly to other Jewish groups, to moderate Jewish groups, to suddenly start doing things that they never used to do. And suddenly you find moderate groups doing some things which otherwise they would have never done. Now, for example, this evening, we're holding a midnight vigil at the Summer White House. And if you people would like to come and let the President know that we're interested in visiting him not just in Washington, but also at the Summer White House here, we, we would like very, very much for you people 
to give up one night on a nonviolent and peaceful midnight vigil this evening. And if you'd like to come, just come up here right afterwards and you can then find out where and when and who and what. Furthermore, on Wednesday at 12 noon in Los Angeles at May Company, Fairfax and Wilshire, May Company has found it necessary to start accepting reservations for Aeroflot, the Soviet airline. Uh, there will be a protest led by several Jewish, Jewish groups. And I believe that if you have a class on Wednesday at 12, it's a mitzvah to cut it <laughs> and be there. Yeah. I uh, would like to remind you. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. And I would like to remind you what that we are the right gambling. Okay. We're going to keep gambling. Right on. Until we win. And you're going to keep on losing. <laughs> sir, sir, let me say this to you. For 23 years, the Jews have said. Eretz Yisrael has got to be the home of two peoples, an Arab state and a Jewish state. And we still say it. And if you think that by turning us down, if you think a generation that has the stench of Auschwitz in its nostrils is going to be worried about what you say, mister, you don't know the Jew at all. You want to fight? Baby, you can't win. You can't win. We're the winners. If you want peace, you'll have peace. Yeah. Yes. I don't. Your concept of that war and mine are very, very different. That's very, very right. That's very, very right. Now, you, now if, you have, if you have anything else to ask, ask it, and then I'll answer it. Are you, are you finished with that question? Fine. Now, you've now finished, at least now, it's an ad hoc end, okay? I'm going to now answer you. If you're not happy, you can ask it again after I have finished the answer. Okay, now. That miserable war in Vietnam is a war between two sides with little to choose from. At no time did JDL say that Saigon is any bargain. Key and two are no bargains. It's a dictatorship, undemocratic, a miserable kind of government. But Hanoi is no better, that's for sure. What, are you nervous? <laughs> Gentlemen, I'll be happy to hear anything you have to say when I finish. But don't interrupt me. I am not your college president. <laughs> now, Hanoi is no better. We Jews understand what it means to have a victory for a communist state, whether it be of the Moscow bloc or the Peking bloc or of any other, other bloc. So don't tell me that Hanoi is fighting there for liberation. If you're telling me that both sides are bad, you're right. That's for sure. I remember a state called Poland in 1939, which was a, a fascist state where Jews used to have their beards ripped out by the roots. But I also know that Jews urged Britain and France to fight for that little fascist state, not because they liked it, but because they understood what would happen if the Nazis won. 
we have no love for Saigon. But we took this stand because we understood what would happen if little countries, good or bad, went under. I know there's a difference between Israel and Vietnam. One is a dictatorship and one is a democratic state. You really are nervous, aren't you? Arab, listen to me. You've got to learn. You've got to learn what the democratic method means. You've got to learn what the democratic method means. So why don't you sit down and shut up, okay? Don't you people realize that you are signing up members for us by this action? In any case, if your friends will let me answer, answer you. I assume that you're, they're your friends, though you're, you're, in, you're in rough company. The fact of the matter is that we understood that that which protects little countries, good or bad, whether you think so or not, but which little countries do know, was U.S. power. Now, the United States wasn't fighting there for a democracy. That's baloney. They were fighting there to make sure that a communist threat was stopped. Now, you may think that that's good or that's bad. That's not the point. That's why they were there. If there are 25,000 Soviet combat troops in the Middle East now, it's because the Soviet Union knows that thanks to the peace movement, the American army is not going to fight, not only in Vietnam, but anywhere else. And that's why we said, fight there, not for democracy, that's baloney, but fight to stop a power which is going to take over a small country, good or bad, because we knew what would happen to other small countries if the U.S. didn't fight there. And I emphasize again, I have no love for those chayas in Saigon at all. None at all. I wish to God there would have been no war. But we understood what would happen in 1971, back in 1968. And if the U.S. Army, and if the U.S. government would understand that if you don't fight for bad little countries, you still have to fight for good ones, we wouldn't have come out backing that war. But we understand what happens in the American mind, the George Putnams of this, of this country. They don't see the difference that you see or that I see. All they know is that the goddamn Jews got us out of Southeast Asia and now they want us to fight for Israel. We're not going to fight. And we understood that. Now you may think that this is good reasoning or bad reasoning. All I ask of you is to understand that not all people that backed that war were fascist types, that there were a lot of decent people who held a very different view of that war than uh, you do. And I hope that that answers your question. Yes. Pardon? In, in what? Yes. Yes, yes. All right, now I want to ask you, before, before all of you people clap, where did you hear that I was an aide to him? I want to know where you heard it. Now, the New York Times, that's the answer, right. The New York Times, which, excuse me a second, ex 
You asked the question, you finished? Are you finished with the question? Good. Now I'm going to finish the answer. Now, the New York Times, which otherwise is a lackey and running dog of the capitalist pigs, right on his right. But this you believe. But this you believe. Now that's a lie. Man, you guys are so screwed up, it's unbelievable. Now I'm telling you and telling each and everybody here that that is a lie. I never worked for that miserable senator or for UAC or for the CIA one hour in my life. And it's a filthy lie and I'm not responsible for what the paper that prints all the news that fits prints. Yes. How do you know what I've done? And how do you know what constitutes a libel? I'm an attorney, and I want to tell, tell you that that doesn't constitute libel. Yes. Yes. Were you there? Well, I was too. And Mr. We were at two separate rallies. And I'm telling you that you're making a mistake, and I'm trying to be nice about it. We never have, and we never will do such a thing. Now, if you are saying that among the general chants and shouts, which many, many people chanted, which many, many people chanted, that there were people who felt that since I was, and since I just several days earlier had been arrested and since have been charged with a felony by, mix, by Mr. Nixon's grand jury, if you thought that it was improper to shout this and not interrupt, nobody interrupted anything, then you have a right to feel that that is wrong. There were many, many, many chants shouted. There were many, many people there that shouted slogans over and over again, not just JDL. There was a relatively, there was a relative small, small group, group there that were noticeably JDL. And I don't know if at a uh, rally of left groups, if suddenly a group of Panthers would have shouted, free, free Bobby, if you would have gotten so uptight. Bear in mind, excuse me, that I did go to jail for Russian Jews. And that there was a little bit of a tie-in with that and that rally. And bear in mind that this was in the middle of our 100-hour vigil for Russian Jews. I really think that if that's the worst thing that we've done, and if you do feel that there were a number of our people who did shout this, perhaps in the middle of some speak, which I didn't hear, then let me apologize for those people. I can guarantee you that it was not done by JDL as such. And I certainly do believe that you know that every single group might have some people that don't always act in the nicest way. I'm quite sure that if you belong to some group, not every single person in that group always does the kinds of things you think are nice. If that happened, it's a bad thing. I was there, I didn't see it happen, but again, if it happened, it was a uh, bad thing, and, we'll, and we, will, we will try not to have our uh, people do this again, okay? We have time for, yeah. we have time for one more question. We have one time last for two more questions. Well.
<laughs> we have really time till 1.30. Uh, I'd like to go from, from side to side. Ken, yes. Yes. First of all, I'm being disbarred. <laughs> all right, okay. Secondly, I really, I, I would really hope, I would really hope that you really don't think that I would ever play games with the lives of young, young people. None of our people at any time is ever told you have to do this. On the contrary, we strongly urge people that if you are going for, for the kind of a life, an occupation, profession, in which you might be in danger of losing out on that, think very, very carefully, and the choice is then yours. S Pardon? Well, first of all, what I would recommend to you is the following that if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, be a lawyer and a doctor in the one country where Jews should all live, in the land of Israel. And when you come to Israel and say, I was in jail for Russian Jews, you might not even have to take the bar exam. <laughs> okay. What? Yeah, you're right, except that, pers yeah, except that we have, we have, been, we have a precedent that per se, in fact, there is a case on point, accusing someone of having a tie with UAC is not libelous per se in New York State. I don't know why, but that's the way the court said it. Yes. Yes, Mr. Mr. Putnam is quite interesting. <laughs> he's, in fact, he's unreal. <laughs> yes, he was. Yes, he announced that. Well, no, no, let, let, me, let, let me make it, make it clear. All right, fine. I in no way share the politics of George Putnam. Mr. Putnam holds views that I would not share. It's that simple. However, Mr. Putnam does have a redeeming quality. He has immense power and influence with with Mr. Nixon and government, which Jews desperately need if you want to help Soviet Jews. And if there's any Jew in this room who feels that he cannot sit down with someone with whose views he differs, even if he knows that that person can help Jews, then I'm telling you quite honestly, he's not a very good Jew. If you're a radical and a Jew, in the end, you've got to say, what am I first? Am I first a radical or am I first a Jew? And my yardstick when it comes to Jews is, is it going to help the Jew? Mr. Putnam can help the Jews much, much more than Senator Jacob Javits can. Because if Senator Javits calls up the White House, the line is always busy. And if Mr. Javits tells Nixon that it's day, rest assured that Mr. Nixon runs down, pulls down the blinds, and puts on the lights. But if George Putnam tells him something, Mr. Nixon listens because he needs Putnam. If he needs Putnam, then Putnam is the kind of a person that can help us. And if I can help Soviet Jews or any Jew, I'll sit down with Mr. George Putnam or with Ho Chi Minh. 
I would have sat down with Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> All right, I think we do have time for one more question, yes. Yes, yes. But louder, please. Well, that, that's a, a, good, a good question on which, to, on which to end, and it's an important one, probably the biggest one today. The question was, what about anti-Semitism in this country? Is it growing? Isn't it growing? And what can Jews do about it? Let me tell you one thing, and I'll state it, and I'll restate what I said before. It is a part of the principle of JDL, the major principle that the one place where a Jew can be safe and live as a Jew is in the land of Israel. And this is why we push Aliyah as the major program. Now, having said that, and having said that, we appeal to the Jews of this country to understand that this country is on a powder keg. It is torn apart by racial violence, it is poisoned by this miserable war in Vietnam. There is a social problem there. There is a growing economic crisis here, all of which bodes ill for this country, and for the democratic process, and for all peoples, and for Jews. And Jews are like all other people in this country, but more so. We get it first. We're the scapegoat, because if you read the right-wing papers, the number one enemy is the Jew. We are responsible for the communists and the blacks and the earthquakes. We are responsible for all the, fe for all the things that the, that the hard hats fear. I'm telling you that the way out is for Jews to go to Israel and to stop running from Brooklyn to Queens to Nassau County to Suffolk County to the lighthouse at Montauk Point and then and time is to go to Israel. Now, but Jews are not going. That's, I know they're not going, going to go. Bel Air is nice. There are no problems in Bel Air. So that's why JDL differs a little bit from Zionist groups, from official Zionist groups. We say go, and we push Aliyah, and we have Aliyah programs. But at the same time, we say, knowing that most Jews are not going anywhere, they're staying here, there has to be a Jewish group that defends Jews. We don't want to build Israel at the expense of Jewish bodies here. We, I don't want to see a single Jew die here so that some other Jews will understand that we have to go. So we do things, and it is imperative to make sure that the democratic process remains in this country and to fight extremist groups from radical right and radical left. Because we understand that the ultimate danger to Jews comes from the radical right. But we also know that the fears which give birth to the radical right strength come from other groups. What makes the great moderate mass that she is for Mr. for Mr. Agnew become afraid and uptight and tense. They're afraid of all sorts of things. They're afraid of a breakdown in the democratic process. And a breakdown in the democratic process means the end of Jews here too. Believe me that if extremism grows in this country, then there is no Jewish future. So we attempt to understand that there are many things wrong in this country that must be fixed and must be changed and must be changed by radical methods through a democratic process, through a democratic process. These are the things that we try to do. I don't know what will happen in this country in five or ten years. I know one thing, that if the economic crisis grows and if enough blue-collar workers are out of jobs, Things will be very, very bad. And more than that, I really can't, can't say except that for you young people here, consider carefully living in the Jewish state. That's number one. Thank you.